culture has contemplated societies with thinking machines for generations, envisioning futures from utopian to dystopian. Visions of R2-D2 have excited our imagination at the same time prompted concerns about how these new entities will impact us and our society at large. These futures are arguably here now, and we find ourselves at the doorstep of technology that can at least simulate the appearance of thinking, acting, and feeling. The real question is now what? And this is what I'll be addressing in this talk, uh, which is based on joint work with Dan Bonnet, Andrew Grodo, and Patrick McDaniel. That Alan Turing famously envisioned in 1950 when he created the Turing test to tell machines apart from humans based on whether a machine could fool a human that is interacting with it into thinking it is human. Maybe, and maybe not. Advanced uses of machine learning and AI allow us to engineer programs that are capable of outputting hyper-realistic communication. This can take the form of images or even potentially full human personas. While there are numerous positive uses of such technology, and we'll go over some of them later in the talk, does this have darker implications if used with the intent to cause harm? We take the example of sophisticated online bots able to emulate human behavior and interact with us seamlessly. As they make the distinction between authentic and fake communication harder than it is already today, these sophist bots could have a profound impact on society by gradually manipulating our trust in content like images or videos. We argue why technical solutions, while important, should be complemented with efforts involving informed policy and international norms to accompany these technological. Google's duplex system makes reservations over the phone by discussing with humans. What learning algorithms have done here is they captured subtle artifacts of spoken English to replicate some of the artifacts that we as humans insert in language, such as hesitations or pauses. And this means that they're able to generate speech that is very conversational and lifelike. On the right, I give another example of Christie's, uh, which announced uh, in the past that they were able to sell in uh, their auction house a piece of art that was generated by a neural network. And so this questions if the involvement of humans uh, is involved uh, in order to generate art that is itself enjoyable to humans. The GAN framework involves two machine learning models trained in a competing fashion. This is the framework that was used to generate the piece of art that I just showed. The first model is called the generator, and it learns how to produce synthetic inputs, such as images or videos. The second model is called the discriminator, and it learns how to classify inputs as being either real or fake. When the label fake is assigned to an input, it means that the discriminator believes that this input was produced by the generator. So this may remind you of the Turing test. And in fact, the discriminator is orchestrating some form of weaker but automated imitation game. And assuming that neither model wins this game early in training, discriminator is going to get gradually better at telling apart synthetic and real inputs, while the generator gradually gets better at producing synthetic inputs that the discriminator finds harder to detect. So we revisit this relationship between the GAN framework and the imitation game later in this talk, because it has implications, uh, in particular for the lack of technology that can detect deepfakes, and I'll come back to that later. And the GAN framework has enabled many creative applications which are beneficial to society. I give a couple of examples here on the right. For instance, the first one is that GANs were used to design dental crowns that fit individual patients correctly. Another example is uh, the numerous applications of GANs to augment the creativity of artists rather than replace artists. For instance, it can help with synthesizing musical notes. And another example has been the application of uh, generative modeling uh, to help with uh, creating movies. Scientific progress made by researchers interested in generative machine learning could also enable potentially less honorable applications 
by individuals with malicious intentions. Some examples might unfortunately uh, include things like bullying, blackmailing, extortion, defaming, or just misleading people. And here I give an example of a piece of research that was conducted uh, recently where researchers found that they were able to apply another form of generative modeling called the recurrent neural network to th synthesize the face and voice of uh, Barack Obama. And so the researchers were able to produce realistic video footage of the former US president, giving an address from a text transcript of their choice. Uh, and while a careful human observer will notice some minor inconsistencies in the videos, if you look closely at what is produced by the machine, it is clear that such a technique could be leveraged by malicious individuals to increase the sophistication of fake news. Uh, for instance, the fake news that is spread uh, on, online by social media bots. All of these discoveries and observations lead to a single conclusion. We are rapidly reaching a point where computational algorithms can create nearly any form of human communication that is for all intents and purposes indistinguishable from reality. We've mentioned a couple of obvious positive uses. Other examples could include telepresence or human-computer interaction. So what does this mean to us as a society? And what does it do to online and offline public discourse, politics, due process, commerce, and society at large? In the presence of individuals with malicious intent, but low technical sophistication, the issue is first one of forgery. And there is actually a history of written words and reported discourse being forged. For instance, in 1777, uh, there was an instance of forged letters claiming that General Washington thought that the revolutionary war against Great Britain was a mistake. Another example is after multiple decades of improvements, Adobe Photoshop has become mainstream and the expression to Photoshop is now a synonym for digitally altering images. What this means is that the barrier to entry for manipulating cotton has been decreasing for centuries already, but the progress in machine learning is just accelerating this process. Things that were less forgeable in the past, such as voice or video, when compared to written words or photos, now are or soon will be. We already have a substantial problem with forged and out of context content. The internet is plagued by fake reviews, fake posts, and fake people fueling misinformation. We also know that carefully crafted social media messages were created to disrupt the public discourse and influence opinion uh, prior and during the 2016 US presidential election. So now if we suppose that adversaries could automate this process and create such cotton with algorithms, then the question becomes, how does that capability change the internet and also affect our society? As the sophistication of adversaries increases, the hypothetical, and I stress hypothetical, but logical conclusion of cotton forgery is a fake human, uh, and we'll refer to this in this talk as the sophist bot. Here, the sophist bot is a program running either in social media or some other infrastructure. It can have opinions, agendas, biases, and can consume enormous amounts of information and maintain nearly infinite number of sim simultaneous conversations. So FizzBots could also have real visages and personalities that will draw people to them. So now if we take this bot and give them a task, these tasks could be anything. It could be political, for instance. You could ask them to promote one candidate over others. You could use them to spread hate content uh, or harass people. Uh, you could also have these bots induce a victim into doing something financially or personally risky. And there are other uh, questionable uh, uses, such as promoting specific services. 
older technologies have already transformed communication in similar ways. If you think about an email and the amount of emails that you get that you don't want to read, it shows you how it, the uh, emergence of email has allowed uh, malicious individuals to craft sophisticated junk mail that can reach millions, if not billions, of individuals. So now if we consider uh, what machine learning can, can do at, at a different scale, this is what we're trying to address in this talk. And in fact, adversaries have already exploited existing online services driven by automated reasoning uh, for malicious ends. Uh, one public example is Microsoft's Tay chatbot, which was an online chatbot that learned to speak in part by interacting with users on Twitter. And adversaries on the internet very quickly learned of this service and trained it to post racist tweets. The service had to be shut down within 24 hours of its launch. So the real question now is how do we identify and possibly eliminate these malicious bots and content from public discourse? There are really two answers to this question, science and policy. We first discuss the, third, the former. We argue as a matter of science, machine learning technology must evolve to make the systems and the models accountable and the inputs and outputs of these models need to be reliably identifiable. Next, I'm going to go over three possible approaches to achieve that goal and explain why each of them is limited. And so our analysis suggests that it is likely that there are no robust technological defenses against this problem. The natural first approach is to automate the process of digital forensics and attempt to identify machine manipulated content by detecting its imperfections. For instance, techniques for manipulating videos often introduce specific video imperfections that can be detected. Body movements and proportions are typically unchanged from the stand-in actor. Techniques such as Eulerian video magnification could help to identify human pulse in videos. And in principle, a detector could identify a deepfake by detecting these imperfections in the video. There has, in fact, been a DARPA proposal to run a media forensics program called Metaphor that is funding research to develop such detectors. And researchers are developing tools that detect deepfakes through these physiological inconsistencies. While it may be possible to design an effective detector against the current generation of deepfake generators, in the long run, we do argue that this is likely to be a losing battle, or at best, a stalemate. Indeed, Detection in machine learning is even more likely to result in an arms race than traditional system and network anomaly detection. This is because of the fact that machine learning algorithms developed to create synthetic content, that's generative models, such as the GAN framework that we introduced earlier, involve by design a generator that is trained to evade detection. This means that as the detector gets better to tell apart synthetic from natural content, so can the generator that creates synthetic content. Every time a new detector is deployed, the generator can be retrained to evade the new detector. At every iteration, the generator will get better, as does the detector, but this process may never converge to a setting that steadily favors the defender. If retraining the generator continues to be less costly, than coming up with an improved discriminator. To summarize this first approach, progress in generative model research is likely to continue to give an edge to those creating fake content in the long term. In the short term, this would very much resemble the status quo in signature-based malware detection, where defenders are constantly defining signatures for new forms of malware. The second approach seeks to provide provenance of human forms of digital communication. Here by provenance, what I mean is building a secure record of all entities and systems that manipulate a particular piece of com. Consider our deepfake example mentioned above. The goal of a data provenance approach would be to identify deepfakes as com that was digitally synthesized 
instead of being captured using the camera. A fairly obvious solution would be to equip every digital camera with a tamper-proof cryptographic cotton signing key. The camera will use the key to sign all video clips that it exports. This way, every video clip is uh, accompanied with a digital signature that identifies the physical camera on which the clip was shot. And such functionality is in fact already available with uh, smartphone applications like the one I show on the right here, the Guardian Projects Proof Mode. Presumably, a deepfake generator won't be able to sign a fake video because it does not have the signing key embedded in the hardware of a real, uh, real video camera. However, this brings the traditional issues of key creation, distribution, authentication, and other issues. So implementing this in practice will be logistically difficult. This would be uh, even more complicated if we want to allow the content to be post-processed, for instance, to crop or apply filters to images or videos. Another way to defeat this uh, provenance system is to use the analog hole attack, where we simply play an unsigned deepfake video on screen and record the screen using an approved camera that will properly sign the videos. The third technological defense is a regime of total accountability. If you are concerned about fake videos, such as deepfakes, and are willing to take extreme measures to protect yourself. What you could do is record every minute of your life on a temp-proof camera that signs and timestamps all of the captured videos. If a deep fake is published of yourself, then you can prove that at the time that the deep fake is supposed to have taken place, you were engaged in a completely different activity. This after-the-fact defense would not mitigate the potential damage to someone's image, but it would let you prove that the deepfake is forgery. Of course, this defense, this cure, may be worse than the disease. The potential loss of privacy from this 24-7 surveillance may cause more harm than the concern over deepfakes. In fact, uh, we are certain that a different instantiation of total accountability is required if we want to avoid uh, every person recreating a version of the Truman Show. Such an approach is in fact being explored within industry. A product called Ember Authenticate proposes to have cameras periodically compute video signatures and record them publicly on the blockchain. This does not require sharing the actual, the actual content of the videos, but nevertheless, it is possible for anyone to access the hashes recorded on the blockchain and given video footage, verify that the hash of this video footage corresponds to what was recorded on the blockchain. This allows one to authenticate the video as having been recorded by the camera at a certain date and time as claimed by the author of the video. From this discussion, it is clear that technology alone cannot address the challenges of fake cotton emulating human behavior through machinery. In fact, the very involvement of humans sets out the potential limitations of any solution addressing this problem purely through technology. Let's take the example of fake news that we've been using throughout this talk. Research has shown that humans actively seek to reinforce their opinions. People will want to hear what they like to hear. And as a consequence, each one of us reinforces their bubbles of opinions through the selectivity and bias of our online connections. This effect is more prevalent in certain demographics, age being the demographic characteristic observed in a recent study to have the most significant effect on sharing fake news with their online connections. Even if individuals attempt to fact check their opinions and break out of a bubble of opinion, finding unbiased information can be difficult and have a limited effect on one's um, misperception. The key is, however, developing public policy, legal, and normative frameworks for managing the malicious applications of technology is in conjunction with efforts to refine 
Fortunately, law and policy typically lag behind technological innovation because the implications of new technologies and how to address them can take time to come into focus. Asimov summarizes this well, science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. New technologies are not always penetration tested from a policy perspective because the forces behind innovation often focus on positive applications and are not always incentivized to think proactively about malicious applications, which are easily cast aside as somebody else's problem, not mine. The way that we address these policy challenges is going to shape our society in future. We simply cannot wait to see the harms emerge before we deal with them. In the paper that this talk is based on, we argue for breaking the problem apart into smaller pieces. For example, in the case of deepfakes that we've used as an example throughout this talk, one approach uh, to break the problem apart is to think around the different actors uh, with a stake in the matter. And then we can identify policy tools that are aimed at either incentivizing them or shaping their behavior. From this perspective, there are a number of different actors whose behavior and decisions are relevant to fake cotton. Uh, this includes uh, the authors of fake cotton, the authors of applications used to create fake cotton, the owners of platforms to, that are hosting the fake cotton software or uh, the cotton itself, educators who are training engineers manufacturers who are developing things like the cameras that people are using uh, to create the videos, owners of data uh, that is being used to create machine learning models, uh, the persons, of course, that are involved in the deepfakes, the platforms that host the discourse and the result of these deepfakes, the audiences that engage with deepfakes, but also journalists that are reporting on these deep things. Breaking down the problem in this way allows us to think more creatively about the range of policy tools relevant to the task at hand. It puts us in a stronger position to identify the right policy tools for the job of shaping the behavior of a given actor. And if necessary, it allows us to identify the need for such new tools. As is the case for research on the security of computer systems, a precise threat model capturing the goal and capabilities of each of these actors who are relevant to the system being analyzed is the first step towards a principal defense. And while no single tool may prove decisive, a comprehensive approach that draws on multiple tools affecting different actors could materially move the needle. In the paper that is uh, the basis for this talk, we argue that this actor-centric approach yields many possibilities. For example, legislatures or courts could clarify that depicting a third person in a deepfake without their consent is defamation. Victims would then have a cause of action for recovering money damages from the authors of the deepfakes. Legislatures could also establish criminal penalties along the lines of legislation pending in the California legislature. Some malicious authors will hide their identities or may not have deep pockets. So holding them liable is unfortunately not a complete solution. Technical measures may be useful in this context, despite their limitations, as we've discussed before. Indeed, authors of software capable of producing deepfakes could be incentivized to include cryptographic signatures to aid detection of deepfakes, perhaps by holding developers who do not include a signature liable for works created using their software. App stores could refuse to carry software that lacks this capability. In the paper that is uh, the basis for this talk, we argue that this actor-centric approach yields many possibilities. For example, legislatures or courts could clarify that depicting a third person in a deepfake without their consent is defamation. Victims would then have a cause of action for recovering money damages from the authors of the deepfakes. 
legislatures could also establish criminal penalties along the lines of legislation pending in the California legislature. Some malicious authors will hide their identities or may not have deep pockets. So holding them liable is unfortunately not a complete solution. Technical measures may be useful in this context, despite their limitations, as we've discussed before. Indeed, authors of software capable of producing deepfakes could be incentivized to include cryptographic signatures to aid detection of deepfakes, perhaps by holding developers who do not include a signature liable for works created using their software. App stores could refuse to carry software that lacks this capability. Platforms that host con could also be required to not only establish a procedure for receiving complaints about deepfakes, but also to provide a concise overview of the principles that govern their standards. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, could then hold the platforms accountable to these published commitments using its unfair trade practices authority. Platforms could also label cotton known or suspected to be machine generated. Obviously, the platforms could not label all machine generated cotton as such for the technical reasons that I mentioned previously in the talk. That said, these labels could still be useful in situations where the authenticity of the cotton is of paramount importance to the authors and the viewers. User research will be useful here to find an implementation that best ensures effective long-term user interaction with such labels and avoid pitfalls uh, such as the implied truth effect on unlabeled cotton. Educators who train the next generation of engineers could also elevate the policy and ethical discussions as part of uh, technical education continue to make it a more important piece of that education. These governance interventions uh, illustrate how breaking the problem down can yield insights as to what we can possibly do to shape behavior uh, from the different actors that are involved in, in the problem here of deepfakes. None of these governance interventions are a silver bullet, and this Conclusion also holds for the technical solutions that we presented before. Some of them also raise other challenges or concerns and implicate difficult trade-offs across other important values uh, or equities. One other issue is that determined bad actors will often find ways around these governance or technical, technological solutions. But for the less determined bad actors, interventions along with what we described in this talk and in the paper that goes with it could contribute to increase the cost uh, of malicious content. In that regard, the test that Turing envisioned in 1950 is more relevant than ever. Will humans continue to be able to identify sophisbots? I think this is a great question for us as a community uh, to, to address and to answer. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions uh, through email or Twitter. Thank you.